very happy that we can start this event actually in the evening, as is uh, a good Buddhist tradition. It, it is a topic that is uh, central for cultures uh, who usually thrived uh, along rivers and shorelines. And uh, then also, uh, if we think about uh, large rivers that disappeared, that often uh, went along also with actually a disappearance of cultures. Hi, I am Prabhat. I'm based here in Delhi at CSDS. I have also been a fellow at Gate Hamburger Center for apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic studies. Uh, I am here at the symposium on water crisis. One of the things in my project is to look at the crisis narratives in Hindi uh, literature during the early uh, 40s and 50s and 60s. In this particular uh, part of the project, I aim to look at how the crisis has been conceptualized, crisis which are what I call waterborne crisis narratives. So how the crisis is imagined, how the crisis is conceptualized, and how within those uh, imaginations, the aftermath of the crisis or what it is called here, the post-apocalyptic uh, visions of future is imagined. The research that I presented here was um, about the transformation in water harvesting system from a very local uh, traditional setup to uh, the centralized water supply that is now um, taking place in the Thar Desert. Uh, I, uh, presented the problems related to such transitions that could be disruption in the waterways or um, um, the construction of the Indira Gandhi Canal that did not take into consideration the uh, local perspectives and the indigenous knowledge systems and has somehow resulted in the uh, dilapidation of the local cultures. Uh, I'm Tarun, I, I'm studying floods and mobility and production of places in Anthropocene. Uh, I study this from a perspective of a very rural leaves region in India called Supal. And I'm trying to understand how floods and mobility interact to produce places in the Anthropocene. And, and since Kappa Center is looking at the apocalyptic vision, I'm trying to produce it from a very local context-based research and see what future look like so people living in a very different world a very remote world and, and, and what it entails for them and what, what meaning do they place on the future? Uh, so apocalypse for me, uh, having worked in a resettlement colony with urban poor, it's like an everyday phenomenon. I don't see it as an end of uh, scenario, uh, end of time kind of an with an uh, end of time kind of an understanding, because uh, it's the everyday apocalypse that goes on when it comes to accessing water in uh, the settlement that I have done. I conducted my research on, uh, in rather, and um, so basically water, uh, the scarcity that is there, uh, accessing water becomes a daily struggle. It's really important to bring local narratives to the larger global discussions because in the end people are living in very context-based locations and, and it's important for these stories to come from to a global larger perspective when we are talking about Anthropocene per se. In places like uh, the Ninja Delta region of Nigeria, where I come from, massive pollution is prevalent. It's been there for, for decades, and nothing is being, you know, mentioned about it, uh, you know. Because in most cases, uh, transnational oil companies, multinational oil corporations collaborate with uh, the government, you know, of these places. Oh, I mean, I think for most of us, if we think of water in the context of an apocalypse, we will go back to the tsunami that happened in South Asia and Asia in 2004. And I think that was perhaps the biggest apocalyptic type of a moment for us to, I mean, for anyone who witnessed those huge waves hitting the shores and the drowning of homes, of lives, of livelihoods of everything, you know. 
I've learned a lot in this symposium in terms of uh, the variety of spa the spatial and uh, temporal and disciplinary variety that the symposium has offered. So from historical understandings to ethnographic studies to religion and uh, water in religions, I think it's it's been a very enriching experience uh, for somebody who has been engaged with studying water uh, in um, in a particular locale. I so talking about Sundarbans or talking about um, you know Niger Valley traditional practices. Uh, all that has added uh, several dimensions to my own understanding of water and the scarcity around it. As we can figure out from the lyrics of this popular song, it appeals to the clouds and by extension the divine beings in the heavenly abode above the clouds to bestow rain and consequent prosperity upon the drought hit la landscape. The landscape is marked by heat waves, sandstorm, parched farmland, burning wood and dwindling pasture land and the resultant depletion of soil fertility of grain stock, animal fodder and water. I think when you talk about the Sundarbans, we need to talk about the fisher folk communities of the Sundarbans. And when we talk about the fisher folk communities of the Sundarbans, it's the fisher women uh, who are very, very important. Look at their lovely smile. It's not easy. Eight to 10 hours, you are completely half immersed in saline water and you're collecting prawn seeds. And from, by selling those prawn seeds, you're meeting your daily livelihood. I was really shocked by some of the um, the papers on on women women's rights um, in South Asia or in Africa. We know about that, but hearing the people who have who are, have been confronted with these people, um, that is totally different. And because it is an eroding land, uh, she told me that before the the body could decay and be consumed by the uh, by the soil and return to dust, it would be ignored by water and would return to water. So return to water in the sense is that these waters are the channels through which they had been trafficked. These waters are on which they have continued their occupation. This water is also their, their grave that they are ignored into. The indigenous water conservation practices, I argue, would be the only way to combat drought in marginal farmers. And as in India, most of our nation, except a few parts of Punjab perhaps, we all have marginal farmers with very small plots of land, which doesn't, who doesn't necessarily are convinced uh, to be able to leave a plot of land just for water preservation and then look at the yield of the other parts of the land that they are holding. Activism, advocacy with the medium of art, with the medium of art, uh, you know, it's vital. You know, the medium of art is vital, including theater, is vital to, you know, uh, creating spaces for the voices of people that are being impacted on by pollution, you know. Uh, for their voices to resound. And I still think uh, that beyond this, more funds should be provided for uh, practitioners, as practitioners, to be able to initiate, you know, to uh, initiate projects, um, um, projects that would facilitate uh, or border on climate justice. Uh, in a post-apocalyptic world, uh, what I've encountered in literature, often the wasteland uh, as a topic is portrayed. So um, it could be anything from um, a drought, um, it could be a flood scenario um, that encompasses the whole world, um, it could be a technocratic system, um, it could be um, well a world that is defined by uh, renewable energy um, systems and um, ultimately it's about envisioning alternate futures. How do we become more aware of the fact that the world is coming to an end? Maybe if we really face an extreme crisis in a certain way. Right? And so uh, perhaps we need to face something extreme to actually change things around. Uh, I don't know but you know 
the vision of an ap apocalyptic world is one where we are completely immune to the fact that the world is ending. Apocalyptic is kind of interesting. I think it means uh, a period of history where uh, a lot of relationships that are conventional reverse in a certain way. So the relationship of good and evil and all of these things reverse in a certain way. And post-apocalyptic, I guess, means maybe another era, like the next era or something like that, the next era after that. Hopefully we won't have the differences that separate us as human beings. That uh, I can't say that we'll all be one because that's a bit too utopian. There will always be divisions and conflicts, but hopefully we have some way of resolving that in the interest of the planet, in the interest of our waters, and in the interest of our future generations.